Thanks um, for the introduction. And um, I know I'm the last speaker of the day and everyone's probably exhausted. So um, I, I like going last because I'm able to kind of tie together some of the themes, but my colleagues made it really easy for me because trust is certainly a central piece that has come out of all of the, the talks today. Um, and it's really central to probably what you've seen on the news media, basically everywhere you go about this trust crisis and the fact that we need to look at trust um, and how to rebuild it. So today, um, my primary research interest is the notion of trust and it has been for about 15 years. And I'm really interested in understanding what trust is, how we can measure it, what we can do about it and how it shapes health behavior. And so it has obvious implications here when we're thinking about data sharing and trying to um, foster trust, build trust so that folks are um, willing to share their data. Um, so you can read the title of my talk. Um, and just before I move ahead, of course, any researcher has a great team behind them. So I just wanted to acknowledge the colleagues and also the funding that has led to um, the, pres or the data and uh, research that I'm going to present at the end of my talk. So the practical problem we've heard today um, is that there are these incredible technologies that we're able to use um, and engage with in order to improve the health of the population, to improve our health systems, um, but we require people to be comfortable in sharing, collecting, and, and using our data to actually help improve the health of Canadians. So there are evident gaps in how we do this. Um, I'm not coming at all from the technology side, but really looking at things through the lens of the consumer. So our patients or our citizens and whether or not they're willing to trust us with their data. Um, so whether or not and, and how these technologies are used and applied is going to be heavily dependent on their trust. And when we're thinking about trust, it's not just trust in government, it's trust in all of the social institutions that factor into data sharing. So we're talking about universities, science, scientists, the public, and all the individuals that are actually behind these technologies. Um, and some of you might be familiar with the NHS, the failed um, data reform um, objective care.data, which was a system that was going to be put in place to improve communications across the healthcare system uh, with the goal of improving the health of the population. And because there was no public trust in the, in the public trust and providers had concerns over data sharing and data management, um, the project was abandoned. And one of the take home messages from this was that public trust will be the key to success of any big health data project. So to foster the sharing of data, we really need to consider the perceived risks or the real risks uh, that are to the consumers. So it's not just about what are the actual risks, but what are the public perceiving to be the risks. Now, it's really important as, as an academic, um, anyway, for uh, us to understand what trust is. So we think about and scrutinize over terms and constructs all the time. So what is trust? What isn't trust? And how trust is different from mistrust and distrust and other similarly uh, semantic terms. And so I just wanted to give a quick overview of what the concept of trust actually means. Um, so it's the acceptance of vulnerability. It's the acceptance of risk. We're not talking about the notion of trust unless we're considering the risk that's involved in our decision. And it's also primarily future oriented. So I'm placing trust in you with the expectation that whatever I'm trusting you with, um, you're going to fulfill that trust. Um, and a really key component, I think, um, that's been talked about in the presentations uh, throughout the day, but maybe hasn't been explicitly stated, is the, the ideas of care and competence that factor into trust. So trust is a multidimensional concept. It, it varies depending on the context you're looking at, um, but certainly within any context, we're looking at the notions of care and competence. So one being, can you do what you say you're going to do? Are you competent to do that? But the other piece that's really, really central, I think, when we're thinking about trust is, do you care? Are my interests in uh, in mind when I'm placing that trust in you? So when we think about data sharing, we're thinking about, you know, how do we communicate to the public that these data are being collected and used for the interest of Canadians and the population? Um, and so that will be a common th theme throughout what I talk about today. Um, so as I said, there, if there's no, no risk involved, there's really no need to be placing trust. And it's important to note too that trust occurs at two different levels. So we have trust in institutions and we have trust in individuals. And those are linked, of course. So if we have trust in the prime minister, how does that influence our trust in the federal government and vice versa? So those are inextricably linked, but trust occurs at those two different levels. So trust and health behavior, how do those two come together? When we look at trust in government, there's evidence to suggest that trust has implications for social cohesion, which has obvious implications for our health. So the fact that we're united as a population and work together towards a common goal, um, it 
that relates to interpersonal trust between citizens. So we've certainly seen as a spinoff of the pandemic, some somewhat of a breakdown of that trust between our neighbors and our fellow citizens. Um, the pandemic has also showed us that trust in the government is really important for the acceptance of government policy um, and the acceptance of government regulated or recommended health behavior. So vaccine uptake, for example. Um, and I highlight the next point because I'm going to focus a little bit more on another theme that's come across today of misinformation and trust in government is negatively associated with believing misinformation and conspiracy theories, which probably comes at no surprise to anyone here. So citizen trust is, is really a critical consideration for any government initiative, and it's gained more attention um, than I've seen before. So I've been working in this space before, and now all of a sudden this concept is just coming up again and again. And really trust, um, declining trust threatens the legitimacy of our social institutions. So we have these institutions that have been put in place to structure the rules and the norms of our societies. And when there isn't a tr trust there, it really threatens the legit legitimacy of our social institutions. And we certainly see evidence of this in the United States um, and elsewhere. And so it's really concerning. This is something we really, really need to address. Uh, right now, what we rely on typically when we're looking at trust levels of trust is the CAN Trust Index. So I've just put up some numbers here looking at uh, what trust looks like based on the most recent data. So we're slightly up in terms of trust in the national government, slightly up in terms of the Liberal, Liberal Party. Trudeau has dropped a little bit, but not much. Um, these data I, I share because they're not looking great, but I would say that across um, I wouldn't say there's evidence to suggest that this isn't just happening in Canada and some are calling this the trust crisis. So we're really seeing a shift again in primarily our social institutions and concerns over um, tr trust becoming a major issue. So what I'm really interested in is research that might inform some practice or tailored strategies that help us to build trust and start thinking about how we address declining levels of trust um, in our in our institutions. And so my research really looks at what I've, I'm really interested in understanding is uh, why are people looking to and trusting in other sources of information? What is it that makes people trust? You know, I, I was just having a conversation with Steve. Why is it that we're okay with Google collecting our data on where we are at all points in time, but we're really, um, you know, we, we don't trust the government to use our data for in, in the interest of citizens. So why is it that we have, have that, um, that different perception of how our data are used? And I think before I go on, just that, that definitely relates to the notion of data literacy and how our data is used and whether or not we even know our data are being collected. Um, but I'm really interested in understanding like, why are we looking for alternative sources of information rather than official recommendations that we would have looked to before. And so misinformation is certainly a huge piece of this. Um, we know that social media has drastically changed the way that we consume news and access information, and we can't compete. Um, in public health, for example, you know, we, we really can't compete with the abundance of information. We, um, and there are risks to us as, as social institutions in trying to compete and engaging in online conversations. Um, that's, that's a broader topic, but I think, you know, we are, we are in competition, competition with much faster um, forms of misinformation and disinformation. Um, and there's a concern over the notion of what is considered legitimate information now. So people are cons or continually seeing their peers and other sources of information as legitimate and authoritative. Um, again, moving away from what we once would have thought as trustworthy individuals and institutions towards other sources of information. And there are real harms arising from this, whether they're intentional or not. Um, I'm, I'm sure maybe I'm not sure, but some of us might be guilty of spreading misinformation accidentally, you know, in what we hear or the way we engage. So it's not always coming from a place of malice. It's it's just that, you know, the internet offers an opportunity for us to, to spread information. Um, but some of these forms of information are intentionally harmful. And when that, you know, quote unquote expertise contrast with information that we're wanting people to listen to um, for like public health, the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, it really challenges what people think about that information and their trust in it. And again, threatens le the legitimacy of our science and social institutions. Um, and misinformation has been said to be um, been actively propagated as a means of destabilizing tr destabilizing trust in government, which um, I'm sure again we're all aware of or have observed observed this rather. 
And another piece I think, again, this came across in talks today too, is considerations of what makes our government or our government officials trustworthy. And we really need to look to some of the social inequities that have driven, in large part, some of concerns of individuals about whether or not our social institutions are trustworthy. Um, so again, the, the public perception of care and competence. Um, so the the perception of the government is really going to depend um, or differ across population groups who feel like the government have, hasn't served their interests and, and indeed have legitimate concerns. Um, criticisms of efforts towards reconciliation, the way that the government have addressed climate change, um, managing the economy or the pandemic, that trust translates back to challenges of trust in our government and social institutions across the board. Um, so it's really critical not just to, to look to the public and say, why don't they trust, but to look inward and say, what makes us trustworthy and how do we, how do we build or foster a sense of trust? Um, how do we act in a way that makes us trustworthy? And I'll just refer to the report that everyone has talked about today, which uh, specifically outlines agenda items or strategies for building trust around um, data sharing. So my program of research has really been around understanding what trust is, um, how it shapes health behavior, how it relates to misinformation. And then what I wanna speak specifically to today is generating tools for measuring trust. Um, and I also wanted to make note of um, the research institute that's down here that I'm, I've just newly become part of the Trust in Science and Technology Research Network at Waterloo. Um, there isn't an online presence as of yet because this is a relatively new research institute, but stay tuned because I think there's gonna be a lot of really neat work that comes out of this institute. So my, my research operates on two arms. The first is, uh, and I'll present some of this, collecting empirical data to really understand the role of trust in health behavior. And then the second day is learning from that in, uh, about what trust is and, and refining the concept in order to be able to develop better measures of trust. So um, I'll collect data and we've been refining our understanding in terms of developing and validating tools for measuring trust so that we can identify where trust needs to be rebuilt across different population groups. And so um, I wanted to present here today some opportunities for potential collaboration. And so I wanted to present these two measures of trust that we've generated. Um, the Trust in Multidimensional Healthcare Scale, which is the TIMS, um, is the first of its kind to look at trust broadly in the healthcare system. So there are no measures developed um, that look at doctors, policies, and the healthcare system. So I'm really excited about this measure. And the second is the trust in government measure. Um, and the trust in government measure wasn't something that we intentionally planned. When we were generating the first measure, uh, we were looking at the acceptance of COVID countermeasures and the role of trust. And in some of our qualitative work, we really flagged that it was all about trust in government. It wasn't about trust in healthcare, which fueled the interest in trust in government. And the reason I've highlighted or bolded will be here is because uh, we now have these measures developed and we've got some funding that we're looking for areas to actually implement these tools. Um, I'll show in just a moment that we, we have data to support the association between trust and lots of health behaviors, but we want to explore this in other areas. And I think that's why I was invited today is to think about the role of trust in data sharing a little bit more and, and look at to developing empirical evidence to support that. So we might do something about it. Um, and so importantly, I think why I'm really energized about these tools is they're going to allow us to identify actual areas where we might um, we might action some interventions. We might look to see and understand where trust is breaking down across different populations using these measures and generate strategies. And I think these measures too can be used as in a, a form of evaluation of interventions. So let's see how our actions might be changing um, public acceptance of, of health information and in this case, data sharing. So uh, our res research has already demonstrated that there's an association between, and again, these would be no surprise, but uh, trust in participation in government funded cancer screening programs. Um, you all would have heard of the new report around um, alcohol and cancer risk. So some of the work we've done in Australia has really shown that um, understanding cancer risk as it relates to alcohol is fairly low um, and trust in that messaging is problematic, at least in the Australian context. We haven't done this in Canada yet. Certainly trust as you'd imagine relates so, so much to vaccine uptake, um, but also the acceptance of behavior change in primary care and the acceptance of health policy. But I think these two measures can be used in intervention and exper experimental studies to investigate trust in the role of other health behaviors where we haven't yet established that association empirically. Um, 
So what we'd like to do is look to identify the extent to which trust in government or providers, health policy and the health system impacts data sharing behavior, for example. Um, interrogate some of the survey items that are within those measures to look at the factors that are actually underlying lower levels of trust. And then again, looking at how this varies across population groups, because it's going to look really different depending on the populations of interest. Um, so I've just given a couple examples of the items within these surveys. So in the TIMS, one might be um, the item I trust that my patient that patient's medical information is kept confidential. Um, and in the TGM, uh, the federal government acts in the best interests of, the, of citizens. The federal government makes decisions that support patient autonomy or citizen autonomy, rather. And the federal government does everything they should to protect the population. So these are items that I've just pulled from those two measures. And so my central message today, and I think nicely this captures a lot of what's been discussed um, throughout the day, is that big data projects are not going to work without the public trust. Um, we need to understand how we can demonstrate that trustworthiness. And I think really critical to that is we need to be trustworthy. Um, measurements like the tools that I presented can assist us with developing tailored and evidence-informed interventions. Um, to do this. So we need to look at why there's a breakdown of trust and what we can do. Um, and we need to follow through and demonstrate accountability. And I think that's a key piece as well, is it's not just about saying we care about trust and trustworthiness, but actually acting on that. And so I think uh, one of our earlier colleagues just talked about, you know, the dangers of when we lose trust, we've lost trust. And we've lost trust for, for a lot of the population already. And it's going to be a factor of rebuilding, um, but also maintaining trust in, in portions of the population that already trust. So it's going to be about accountability. And I'm not sure how to go about doing that, except when we think about big data sharing, it's being sure that the mechanisms that are in place to protect data are going to work and, and ensure that we don't, you know, lead to, to greater losses of trust in places where that's been, but also putting people in charge of actually acting on uh, what we say we're going to. So whether that's data literacy and supporting um, initiatives to demonstrate to the public how their data are being used for the better of the health pop or the population, um, or just ensuring that, that what we say we're going to do, we do, and there's a follow through. And I think there's a need for ongoing evaluation as well to determine whether or not the work we're doing is, in, is having its intended effect. So the communication, data literacy, and, and, and accountability are going to be really key. And I'll just leave us with, um, from that report I mentioned earlier, that one of the ways what we need to do is create transparent, proactive two-way communication with the public to help earn and sustain their trust. Um, and again, the last piece really demonstrating that the work that we're doing is in the interest of the population and making sure that that point um, comes across clearly. And then we, we demonstrate that through the use of um, the technologies that folks that around here have developed. Um, and that's all. Uh, so a few minutes for questions um, before we take our final break. I'll start with Vic and then come this way. Just a quick one for Samantha. Yeah. I didn't hear you say much about polarization in politics and like certainly south of the border, it seemed like the level of trust in public health recommendations was really split by political ideologies. And Yeah, that's a really good question. And I don't have any, I guess, evidence from the work that we're doing, but I think either polarization is more pronounced, which is my perspective, or it's just more evident now. Um, I have real concerns when I mentioned social cohesion. I am really concerned about polarization and division in the Canadian population. And um, an area that I didn't talk about is really going to be the importance of rebuilding trust between citizens, because certainly with the pandemic, uh, that was challenged with people's different perspectives on, um, you know, government mandates that were put in place. And I'm sure everyone in this room anecdotally also knows of families or friend breakdowns or, you know, dissent within um, presumably, you know, tight knit communities and networks that um, really disintegrated as a result of different perspectives. And I think, um, you know, the Freedom Convoy was something that was really concerning and, uh, of course, um, but was um, a symptom of a big problem. Um, and so, 
yeah, well, I, well, I, well, I don't have data to support this. I think we have a lot of work to do in rebuilding trust within citizens as well. And I think rebuilding trust in institutions has a big role to play there for sure. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Mariam and uh, I'm coming from the Kai High, the analytic uh, tools uh, and techniques department, which is kind of very new, young, depend, de relative to the other departments. Um, you know, in all talks from t today, I feel that the trust is only interpreted um, only in terms of the preserving the privacy and security of data. Uh, I'm coming from the IT background in software engineering, and uh, a couple of years ago that I have published a paper that uh, we formulated trust in terms of uh, trade-off between usability and security. And uh, my question for you and maybe the rest of the uh, audience here is that how do you think that usability of sharing and using the data uh, can, uh, I mean, for the, all the stakeholders, you know, the policymakers, the, the data owners, the public, the users, the customers of the end users of the, the, the result of the analysis can contribute to the trust uh, despite all the risk and do you mean usability on the, the part of the individuals who are I mean, um, working on emphasize and working on improving the usability of the models and uh, emphasizing on the importance of the usability and the benefits, I believe it can contribute to the trust as well. And people can uh, welcome the risk because they will be aware of the benefits. Yeah, I, I think that's really critical. And it, it relates again to that idea of demonstrating that the decisions that were made or we're making is in the interest of citizens. But I, I also, to your point, I think that someone mentioned earlier today, you know, that these technologies also need to be um, functional for all of the population. So when you have data that benefits some members of society over others, we're just going to further those cracks in the breakdown and trust across subpopulations who are already um, disadvantaged or haven't been privileged by the the benefits of the social institutions that structure our society so far. Does that does that answer your question? So I want to emphasize that it's a trust is not only about the security, it's a trade up between the research and the benefits of the application and the security and privacy of the data. Thank you. Yeah, I think my question is very similar to my colleague here. If, strangely enough, I come from an IT background too, so <laughs> we have the same perspective. Um, I think it's the, the question I had is we talked about vulnerabil uh, vulnerability and the risk associated to enter in a trust relationship, but the reward aspect should also have an influence to level set the, the threshold where we say, yes, I'm going to jump in. And I think that's that's and I don't have data to back this up, but personal opinion, I think it's a lot, it's one, probably one of the sources why uh, people trust social media, because they have that either psychological, physical, or, or moral reward of instance gratification in getting this, where it's a lot harder to do in a public health or a public um, uh, discourse with government. Trust has to do with familiarity as well. It also has to do with time. Um, so I, when I was talking about sort of the difference between trust and related concepts, you know, um, there are situations where we're more dependent, for example, instead of trustworthy. Um, I think you're right in the social media provides us with that emotional element, the effective element of trust um, that's, that's so critical. And, and most of my work helped her works in most of my research is in the healthcare context, and we talk about vaccine hesitancy as it relates to the use of complementary alternative medicine, for example. And the data have just shown the amount of time and commitment that an alternative care provider might spend with um, with a patient is very different than in a primary care setting. And so there is that emotional element that factors in as well. That's huge, and and I think too the. Until recently, I guess I would say, you know, we didn't really have a face of some of our social institutions. I mean, I think that we became much more familiar with Teresa Tam and Justin Trudeau 
um, because we saw them all the time. And so all of a sudden we had a face of an institution that was really abstract. In some ways, you could look at that as being problematic if, if there isn't trust in those individuals, but also it just made people aware of their need to trust. So when I mentioned the idea of risk, you know, I don't think that people are always aware of the risks until they're presented with them. So there's just a taken for granted, and this is getting into too conceptual, but you know, there's a taken for granted trust or a blind trust, which I would say isn't trust at all, because you're not thinking about that risk. And, and Steve and I, I were just again talking about, you know, in the vaccine world, we say, you know, you don't want to present the notion of vaccines to people and say, um, there are minimal risks, because as soon as you introduce that idea of risk, people are going to say, oh, wait a second, there's risk. And so um, all of that factors in, there's an emotional element. And um, I guess to my point, I think that the pandemic really highlighted how involved social institutions are in our health. And so um, we're just more aware, and, and, and that's probably part of it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I, time's up, unfortunately. Yeah, so no. we have uh, oh, we have one more question. Uh, are there examples of uh, agencies or departments that have been able to earn back trust? Is it better to restructure, rebrand, rebuild to establish neutral uh, to establish a neutral level of trust? You know what? I, what I would say is. Not that I'm aware, not of which I'm aware, and I, um, I don't know if there's one solution because I think it's so context dependent. I think it's so based on the institutions, and it's going to vary across subpopulations. And I know that's not helpful, um, but that's what we're working towards. And I think it, it's going to be about doing the research and working with the right folks to to start working towards strategies. And that's where that accountability piece comes in. I think myself included, there's been a lot of sort of, we need to rebuild trust, we need to do this, and and not as much of the action piece. So um, I, I'm not to say that there, there aren't examples, but um, I think within the Canadian context, we've got some work to do, and I'm excited to do it.